Okay, hello class. This is Dr. Lyons again. Uh, and in this chapter, we're going to be talking about something known as cellular uh, reproduction. Uh, and so I don't have any pictures of cellular reproduction, but I do have a picture of these two cute fish. Uh, these are what are known as sharp nosed puffer fish. Uh, so because they are members of the puffer family, that means that when they get scared, they puff up. Uh, but these fish are only about an inch long, so when they do puff up, it's pretty adorable because it's not like they get huge uh, like a bigger puffer fish would. So first of all, let's talk a little bit about why we should care about cellular reproduction. So one reason we should care about it is that it tells us about how we grow and develop. All right, so on the right there, this, uh, there's a picture of a, of a very young doctor, Dr. Lyons, uh, with my cute little clip-on tie. Uh, and there's obviously a much larger version, older version of myself. Obviously, I got bigger between when this picture was taken and this picture. Uh, I developed, right? So my, my shape changed in that time. Uh, and the reason why those things can happen is because of cell, cellular reproduction. Uh, it's because cells can, can make more of themselves. Uh, so that's one reason it's important. Uh, another reason why it's important is because uh, it can tell us more about what goes on with cancer. Uh, so a lot of uh, what makes cancer happen uh, is irregularities in the cellular reproduction process. Right, so by, by learning about cellular reproduction, we'll learn a little bit more about, uh, about why, why cancer happens. Uh, and then finally, one other thing that's kind of important uh, uh, about cellular reproduction uh, is it kind of tells us why it is that there are, that there are multicellular things on the planet. Right, so all of us are multicellular, uh, but it wasn't always the case that there was multicellular life on the planet. Something like uh, a half a billion years ago is when we see the first multicellular life. Uh, and before that, everything was single celled. Uh, and essentially, you can't have multicellular life without cells inside of the body of a multicellular thing growing and, and dividing. Uh, you know, because we all started as one individual cell. Uh, you know, at that magic moment where the sperm and the egg came together. Uh, but obviously now you're made up of many more than just one cell. You're made up of millions and millions of cells. And the reason why that can even be the case is because of cellular reproduction. So cells need to be replaced. Right? The cells that are inside of your body right now uh, are not the same cells that you have had your entire life. Right? So I want you to think about these different types of cells. Uh, so bone cells, red blood cells, skin cells, uh, and cells that line the, the inside of your stomach. Uh, and I want you to think for a minute about which of these do you think would have the longest lifespan and which would have the shortest lifespan, right? So which of these types of cells last for a long period of time uh, or, or a short period of time? So here's the, the actual... Uh, so here's the actual times that, that these different types of cells last. So bone cells can last quite a while, something on the order of 20 to, uh, 25 to 30 years. So that means for a lot of you, you have bone cells inside of your body that you had since you were bo uh, born. Uh, blood cells only last four months. Skin cells, uh, very not very, very long. Uh, I'm assuming that's probably what a lot of you thought would be the, the shortest living cell. But actually, the, the shortest uh, uh, living cell inside of our bodies are, the, are those that live inside of our stomach. Right? So, so those cells that line our stomach, because they're in such a uh, nasty place, you know, with all that stomach acid and such, uh, those cells don't last very long at all, right? really just two days. Uh, so in the, you know, in, the, in the course of, of, of in, in the time that this course has elapsed since the beginning of the semester, Essentially, you've gone through many, many, many iterations of stomach, stomach lining cells uh, since we began. Okay, so let's talk uh, uh, a little bit of an overview on, on what we're going to be covering in this chapter. All right, so now you know why cellular reproduction is important. Uh, and now we're going to talk about what actually happens uh, in two different processes, uh, what are known as mitosis and meiosis. Uh, where cellular re reproduction actually takes place. So both of these involve replicating DNA and then essentially um, 
moving that DNA into two daughter cells. Uh, so the DNA replication part of this is really important uh, because what it ensures is that the two cells that came that come about from one cell, that both of those cells have all the DNA that they need. Uh, if cellular reproduction was to take place without DNA being replicated, then the, the daughter cells would only have half the amount of DNA that they need. So DNA replication is really important. Right, so keep in mind what you learned uh, in chapter 10 when we were talking about DNA and its structure and how it replicates. So the, the format that DNA is partitioned out uh, into daughter cells during mitosis and meiosis uh, is in the form of these chromosome things. Uh, so inside of a chromosome, there are thousands and thousands of genes and, and, and millions and millions of individual letters of A's and T's and C's and G's. Uh, and what you're looking at here is a type of uh, animal uh, that if you count it up, there are 46 total uh, uh, chromosomes inside of this living thing. Uh, and those chromosomes come in these pairs, right? So for instance, there's two chromosomes that are paired up uh, that essentially make what's known as the first chromosome. Uh, and why those chromosomes come in those pairs is because they're what are known as homologous. Right, so one of these came from mom and one of these came from dad. And the particular animal we're talking, we're talking about here is a human. Right, so humans have 46 total chromosomes in, in 23 pairs. Right, so we get 23 chromosomes from mom and 23 chromosomes from dad. Uh, that's, how, that's how it works. Uh, and that's why you, know, you resemble your parents because half of your DNA came from mom and half of your DNA came from dad. Uh, something that I find kind of interesting is the number of chromosomes that different organisms have inside of their bodies. So we have 46 total uh, chromosomes. But despite all of our you know, complexities and our intelligence and whatnot, we actually don't have the most chromosomes of any living thing. Uh, I know that the kind of natural inclination is to assume that we would because we're so complex. Uh, but actually, things like bison have more than us. The, your dog at home has more chromosomes than you. Uh, if you have an infestation of this type of rat in your apartment, then, then those have more chromosomes than you. But actually, the thing, that, the thing that has the most chromosomes of any living organism actually is a type of plant. Uh, it's a type of fern that has uh, 1,260 uh, chromosomes, which is remarkable that, you know, it's a plant, so it's a very sim pretty simple organism. But even among plants, ferns are super, super simple. You know, these are not nearly as complex as, you know, as things like uh, like like typical trees or or, or flowering plants. Uh, so it's a pretty simple plant, and that has more chromosomes than anything else, as far as we know. So chromosomes are uh, kind of come in two different formats. Uh, there can be, uh, they come in a sort of thin, uncondensed format during what's known as interphase, which we'll get to in a minute. Uh, essentially what you see here, this is the nucleus, uh, and all of the DNA inside of that nucleus is uncondensed. Uh, so it's not all, all bunched together uh, really nicely. Uh, it's just kind of like loose coils. But then what you see over here, uh, you can see this is one individual chromosome right there. There's another individual chromosome right there. There's another one right there. You can see the each specific chromosome because all of the DNA is, is, has been condensed. Uh, and essentially your, your cells, typically that they're in this format where the DNA is not condensed, but before, uh, before things are gonna happen, before mitosis or meiosis is gonna happen, uh, the DNA is gonna all become condensed. Uh, and that's gonna make it easier to say move this bit of DNA over to one side of the cell and move this bit of DNA over to another side of the cell. Because uh, essentially what's going to happen in mitosis and meiosis is that we're going to move bits of DNA around inside of the cell. Uh, and in all the DNA that ends up on one side is all going to then be the DNA of that cell that's going to be over there. And all the DNA that's on the other side is going to be all the DNA that goes in a different cell that's going to be over here. So before, uh, before mitosis can really take place, uh, DNA, has to be, uh, DNA has to be duplicated, right? So all the chromosomes go through a duplication process, right? So you start with one chromosome, you make another copy of it, 
uh, and these copies we refer to as sister chromatids. So sister chromatids are two chromosomes that are identical to each other. Uh, and they are bound to each other in the middle by this thing known as a centromere. So I underlined uh, the letter M in here because M is in the middle and a centromere holds these two sister chromatids together in the middle. Uh, we're going to come across another word in a little bit that's going to sound similar to centromere but isn't going to have that M. So remember that M means that it's uh, something that holds two sister chromatids together at the middle. So mitosis uh, is the first process we'll talk about and then we'll get to mitosis a little bit after that. Uh, but what mitosis does is replicating somatic cells. Uh, somatic, uh, somatic cells are any cells that are not gametic. Uh, and so gametic should make you think of the word gamete. Uh, and gamete refers to eggs and sperm. So it refers to the, uh, the cells that our bodies produce uh, during the process of sexual reproduction. So those are gametic cells, eggs and sperm. Everything that isn't that are somatic cells. So mitosis is, is doing the work of replicating all the cells in your body that aren't eggs and sperm, right? So all of your bone cells, all of your skin cells, all of those cells that line uh, the inside of your stomach, uh, all of that stuff being replicated is done with mitosis. So mitosis is actually something that's going on inside of all of us right now, because uh, we're always replacing uh, old cells with new cells and, and cells are constantly dividing. So kind of the, the, the point of mitosis is to produce two daughter cells that are genetically identical to each other, uh, meaning that uh, the DNA in one is essentially just a, a duplicated copy of the DNA in another. Uh, and, and we'll kind of see why, why that is the case. Uh, and why that's important is because all of the cells in your body needs, need all that DNA. Uh, so it's important that all of them have an identical set of, of DNA. So essentially, um, kind of a way to visualize this is that a skin cell uh, on the tip of your pointer finger uh, is going to have the same exact DNA in it as a skin cell, you know, at the tip of your of your toe uh, because of the process of mitosis. So mitosis occurs during what's known as the mitotic phase. Um, Whereas most of the time that a cell is doing its thing, it's in interphase. So interphase is when a cell is just, you know, growing, metabolizing, making products, making proteins, just doing its normal cell business. Uh, and so in interphase, one of the, the important thing that happens in terms of mitosis uh, is that within interphase, there's something known as the S phase and S stands for synthesis. Uh, and what happens during that is chromosomes are duplicated. So you see here, we start with one chromosome and we've duplicated it. Uh, and so I want you to think for a second, try to remember what was the name of these two that are, that are connected to each other. Uh, these are what are known as sister chromatids. So we produce sister chromatids uh, and, then, and then that cell goes into the mitotic phase. So actually going through cell division. Uh, and when it does, uh, those two sister chromatids are gonna be split apart and we're going to end up with two daughter cells that that have uh, that each have one of those sister chromatids. And because those sister chromatids are identical, that means that the DNA inside this cell is identical to the DNA inside of this cell. Which is why, like I was saying before, uh, that you know the skin cell on your finger has the same exact DNA as the skin cell on your toe. So one important thing is that mitosis is only occurring very you know for very brief times. You know, most of the time, so, you know, something like 90% of the time that each cell spends uh, is just an interface, just doing its normal cell thing. Uh, so it's not as if every single cell in your body right now is going through mitosis. Uh, most of them are actually in interphase. But because you have millions and millions of cells in your body right now, that, that means that there's a lot of them are, are in mitosis. So let's talk about what happens during uh, mitosis. Uh, so first we'll start with interphase, uh, which is not technically mitosis, but it's the lead up to mitosis. Uh, and so what happens during, uh, during interphase is we have the DNA is, is uncondensed uh, and it's, it's about to be condensed at the beginning of, of uh, mitosis. Uh, we have the DNAs inside of a nucleus uh, and something that is forming are what are known as centrosomes. 
So I told you before that you were going to see another word that sounds like centromere. So remember, centromere, that was the thing that holds together two sister chromatids. And centromere has the letter M in the middle of it. So centromeres hold sister chromatids together in the middle. Whereas centrosome has the letter S in it. So these things are going to go to the side of the cell during mitosis. Uh, and they're going to be used for, for the the process of moving the DNA around. So centrosomes are forming during interphase. So then when we get into prophase, uh, uh, which is the first step of actual mitosis, uh, there's a few things that happen. So first of all, uh, the, the chromosomes are all condensed. So you can see now you can see these individual chromosomes, whereas over here you can't. Uh, and the very important reason for that is because it's going to be a lot easier to, to split apart chromosomes when they're nicely condensed like this. Uh, as opposed to here, if they're not very nicely condensed, it's going to be pretty hard to split up the chromosomes uh, when it's all a mess like this. So all the chromosomes get tidied up so they can be easily moved around. So that's one thing that's happening. Another thing that's happening is that the centrosomes are spreading to, to either end of the cell. Uh, and what they're doing is they're leaving these spindle fibers uh, going across the, the cell. Uh, and what this whole mechanism does, uh, the centrosomes in the spindle fiber, uh, is that they're going to actually pull the, the chromosomes to either ends of the, of the cells. Towards the end of prophase, then the, the nucleus comes apart, uh, and the, the, in the, the um, in the, centro, the, the centromeres, so that's the middle parts of the sister chromatid, start attaching to these uh, spindle fibers. So essentially, all, so essentially now we're all ready to go. Now the, everything is in place to make mitosis happen. Uh, so the, the, the DNA is duplicated. They're in sister chromatids. The sister chromatids are connected to each other by centromeres. And we have centrosomes in, uh, on either end of the cell and fibers going through the cell to help move the, the chromosomes around. So then in the, the metaphase part of, of mitosis, uh, then what happens is all of the, the chromosomes are lined up in the middle of the cell uh, as, as such. Uh, in the anaphase, then those uh, chromosomes are broken apart from each other. So the sister chromatids split apart uh, and the spindle fibers connected to the centrosomes, this, they start to act kind of like a fishing line. So imagine you've got like a fishing reel, that's the centrosome, you've got the fishing line, that's the spindle fiber, uh, and it essentially pulls in the chromosome towards this end of the cell. Uh, in this uh, 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 centrosome over here, that's gonna pull this chromosome this way. So the chromosomes are getting pulled apart. Then in telophase, uh, what happens is the nucleus starts to reform. Uh, so the, 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 the nucleus is now reforming. There are two new nucleus or nuclei, I should say, are now forming around the DNA that is there. Uh, so that's the thing that happens in telophase is that the nucleus is reforming. At the same time that telophase is happening, uh, something known as cytokinesis is occurring at the same time. So cytokinesis, the first part of that word cyto, uh, should make you think of a part of the cell that we talked about uh, way back in chapter four. Uh, so we talked about the cytoplasm, and so that is the fluid inside of the, the cell. Uh, and cytokinesis refers to the splitting up of that fluid. Uh, it's essentially taking one cell and pitching it into two daughter cells and, and splitting apart all of the, the cytoplasm and all of the uh, other uh, organelles that are inside of the cell. Uh, and this occurs differently between animals and plants. Uh, and the reason why it occurs differently between the two is that plant cells are rigid because they have cell walls, whereas animal cells don't have that. Animal cells such as ours just have a, a plasma cell membrane. So what happens in animal cells uh, is that there's a, a bunch of fibers around the cell. Uh, and those fibers start to contract and they start to pull in. Uh, so imagine if you had a balloon, for instance, and you tied a string around the balloon. If you were to start tightening the string, uh, it would start pinching the balloon so that it would start to look like two different balloons. Uh, and what happens here is those fibers finally condense all the way down and then pop, 
and you have two new daughter cells that are now separated from each other. So that's what happens in animal cells. Uh, in plant cells, it, it goes on a little bit differently uh, because plant cells have a cell wall, so you can't just pinch them because they're rigid. So what happens in the case of, cell, uh, of plant cells is that essentially new cell wall forms in the middle. Uh, so we start to build a cell wall between the two sides. Uh, and eventually that wall is completely built uh, and now the two different cells are separated from each other. You know, so imagine if you were in a room uh, and you put up a divider, you know, across the, the room uh, and, and, you know, and, and made it permanent with, you know, with wood and with, and with particle board and whatever, uh, you would now have two different rooms uh, by building a wall between them. So that's what happens in, uh, in plant cells. Okay, so, so let's just go over the steps again really quickly. Uh, and I'm going to teach you an acronym to help you remember the steps and remember the order of the steps. So in interphase, uh, the cell is essentially doing just this normal thing uh, so that the, the DNA is replicating uh, and, the, and the cell is, you know, just doing its, its typical, you know, making proteins and, and serving whatever function it does. So that's interphase. Uh, in prophase, uh, that's when the, the nucleus starts to come apart. Uh, the chromosomes start to condense, the spindle fibers start to form. Uh, so we have prophase, or the word peed. Uh, in metaphase, or myself, uh, in metaphase, then all of the chromosomes line up uh, in the middle. Then in anaphase, uh, and we have the, the, uh, the word at, in anaphase, we uh, separate all of the, the chromosomes, uh, and they start to move in opposite directions. Then in telophase, we, uh, all, all of the, the, the two new nuclei start to form. Uh, and you're probably all wondering what's going to be the next word. It's club. I peed myself at the club, which is not a true story. It's just a good way to, to remember uh, the order of these steps. So in cytokinesis, finally, we, uh, what happens is the, is the cells pinch apart and, and the cytoplasm gets, uh, uh, gets partitioned between the two cells. So if you can just remember that that phrase, I peed myself at the club, or remember any other phrase if that one's too disgusting for you, uh, then that can help you to remember the, the order of the, the steps here. So just remember, I peed myself at the club. So uh, last thing I wanted to talk about uh, in, in the context of mitosis is how it relates to cancer. Uh, and so I think may, maybe for some of you, it might be fairly obvious. Uh, what happens with cancer is that you have cells in a certain part of the bar body start to grow and divide uh, out of control. Uh, and how that relates to mitosis is that mitosis is the process of a cell dividing. So typically when, when a cell in your body uh, uh, is, is going to divide, your body tells it to do so. Uh, there's typically a, a, a mechanism that prevents a cell from just dividing, you know, out of control. Uh, there is a sort of regulatory system that your cells obey and listen to that system and don't divide unless they're told to do so. You can kind of think of it as like a traffic light, right? So at a traffic light at an intersection, uh, there's a light and when it's red, you, you're not supposed to go through the light, obviously, and when it's green, you can go. Uh, it's kind of the same way with this. So the cells inside of your body, uh, there's uh, essentially a traffic light that is telling them, no, don't divide, just keep doing your thing, but don't divide. And then it turns green and then the cell has the okay then to, to go and divide. But just like certain motorists, cells will sometimes ignore the system, right? Just like motorists will sometimes ignore traffic lights, uh, although they shouldn't. Uh, cells will occasionally do, uh, do just that. They will ignore the signal that is telling them not to divide, uh, and they'll just start dividing rapidly uh, and, and can do so uh, out of control. Uh, and how that essentially happens is that you have a mutation to their DNA. Uh, so there's, there's coding inside of all of our cells uh, that, that, that makes those cells listen to and obey that system that, that prevents them from just dividing rapidly. But sometimes mutations happen that causes a cell to start ignoring that system. Uh, and when that happens, then that cell is going to start dividing and it can form a tumor uh, because you have all of these cells that are growing very, very rapidly, uh, much more rapidly than the cells around them that, that don't have that mutation. 
Uh, and so when uh, a tumor forms, uh, you know, one of two things can happen. You know, one thing that can happen is that it can be, you know, detected. Uh, and if detected early enough, it can be removed. And if the uh, and if the cells inside of that tumor haven't spread anywhere else, then it's considered a benign tumor, and, and this is the best case scenario. Uh, so that's why it's really important to visit doctors, you know, as often as you can, because uh, they can do screens to make sure that you don't have any any cancerous, you know, cells inside of you. Uh, because the alternative then is that if a cell starts to divide a lot and forms a tumor, uh, and it's not addressed. Uh, eventually what can happen is that the cells inside of that tumor can start spreading to other parts of the body. Uh, so that's when this, when that tumor is no longer benign, it's what's called malignant. Uh, and that is when a person has a really major problem. That's when a person has cancer. Because essentially once those cells start spreading throughout the rest of the body, uh, it's a lot harder to treat. Uh, if the cells are only, if the cells that are dividing rapidly are only in a tumor in one specific place in the body, the tumor can be removed, uh, and and with relative uh, and, and with pretty good success, you know, it, it might not grow back. Whereas once the tumor uh, is is now exporting cells throughout the rest of the body, uh, cancerous cells, then now there's a big issue because it's then harder to kill those those cells once they're spreading throughout the rest of the body. So that's when a person would need um, like like chemotherapy, for instance. Uh, once the once the tumor is benign and the cells are, are spreading out. Uh, but again, why why cancer kind of relates to mitosis is that uh, is that cancer is essentially caused by cells you know doing mitosis way too much uh, by not listening to the the regulatory systems that prevent them from from just dividing rapidly. So now we're going to switch to meiosis and talk about that a little bit. Right, so we talked before about how uh, about how mitosis is used for for somatic cells, anything that aren't gametes. So meiosis is then used for gametes for making eggs and sperm. Right, so meiosis is only used for sexual reproduction. Uh, and there's a couple of things that I want to kind of teach you about in meiosis before we actually talk about the process of it. Uh, one important thing is that it involves a switching between uh, diploid and haploid. So what diploid and haploid refer to uh, is, the, is the number of sets of chromosomes a living thing has inside of its body. So uh, if you are diploid, that means that you have two sets of chromosomes inside of your body. Uh, if you are a haploid, that means you have just one set of chromosomes inside of your body, right? So all of us as adults, we are diploid uh, because we have two sets. We have a set of chromosomes from mom and a set of chromosomes from dad, right? So we have 23 total chromosomes, right? One from, from each parent. Uh, but then what happens is that, uh, is that parents or, or anybody for that matter, when they make eggs and sperm, those eggs and sperm are haploid. Uh, they only have one set of chromosomes inside of them. Uh, and there's a very important reason for that. Uh, and the reason is that if you were to put two sets of chromosomes inside of this egg cell and two sets of chromosomes inside of the sperm cell, when they come together, then the resulting human, the resulting uh, zygote, that, which is a word for the, the first cell that is you, uh, if there was if there was 46 chromosomes here and 46 there, then all of a sudden you would have 92 chromosomes, uh, which would be the the incorrect amount of chromosomes to have as an adult. So essentially, what we do is we just take half of our chromosomes, put them into eggs and sperm, uh, and then because an egg and a sperm they they each have half the amount of chromosomes they need, they put together their total set of chromosomes, and then they're back to uh, having the correct amount, back to having 46. Right, so we have 46 as adults, eggs and sperm have 23. So as adults, we're diploid, but eggs and sperm are haploid. So meiosis uh, begins in the same exact way uh, that mitosis does. So it begins with duplicating chromosomes. Right, so we're going to form sister chromatids just like we did uh, in, in the case of mitosis. But now where uh, meiosis deviates from, from mitosis, starts off right, right at the beginning, basically. Um, 
So what? Uh, so one important thing that happens uh, is that during uh, the pro, pro, what's called prophase one, because there's going to be a second prophase, what happens during prophase one in meiosis uh, is that homologous chromosomes. So so those are chromosomes that uh, that pair up with each other essentially, right? So like one from mom and one from dad. So like these are homologous chromosomes here, for instance, uh, and they form what are known as tetrads. Uh, so the, the prefix tetra refers to four, and you can see there's like four things right here. Uh, so there's these four things, which is why they're called tetrads. By the way, a good way to remember that, remember uh, what tetra means, uh, is to remember the game Tetris. So probably a lot of you are too young to have ever played Tetris, but it's the game with the shapes that fall down from above, and you have to like stack them in such a way that, uh, that, 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 they, that they cancel each other out, essentially. Uh, so it's a classic, you know, computer game, uh, and all the shapes that fall from above, they're all made up of four blocks, which is why it's called Tetris. So Tetra means four. So you see four things right here, and this is a tetrad. Uh, and something occurs with these tetrads that doesn't occur with mitosis. Uh, what happens here is that a little bit of, of this red chromosome from mom will swap with a little bit of this blue chromosome from dad. Uh, so this is what's known as crossing over. So bits of DNA are swapped around uh, during, uh, during prophase one, uh, which does not occur during mitosis. Uh, then in metaphase one, uh, we have these things lining up in the middle, just like you know normal uh, metaphase and mitosis. So we have the homologous chromosomes line up in the, in the middle. Uh, and so something really important that happens uh, is that we are lining up homologous chromosomes rather than lining up sister chromatids. Uh, because what's going to happen is that anaphase is going to be a little different between mitosis and meiosis. Uh, in anaphase of meiosis, so in the first anaphase of meiosis, what happens is that the sister chromatids stay remain or, or stay attached to each other. Right? So those sister chromatids that are that are more or less identical to each other, aside from where crossing over occurred, uh, those still stay with each other during anaphase one of, of meiosis. Uh, the homologous chromosomes split up, so like the, the mom and the dad chromosomes split up from each other, uh, whereas the, the sister chromatids stay attached to each other. So that's what happens in anaphase one. Then in, in telophase one and cytokinesis, pretty much the same thing that happened uh, in telophase and cytokinesis of mitosis, right? So the nucleus starts to reform, the cell splits apart. Uh, and what we now have is two cells that are essentially haploid uh, because, uh, because this is, you know, two sister chromatids, which are, which are identical to each other, or pretty close to identical to each other. Uh, and so now this cell has just half of the DNA that we started with. Each of these just have half. Uh, so they're now haploid. So haploid meaning just one set of chromosomes. Then uh, the rest of meiosis is identical to mitosis. We're going to go through another prophase uh, where, again, the, the fibers are going to form, the, the nucleus is going to go away, uh, and the, the chromosomes are going to get all attached to the fibers and get ready to be moved around. In metaphase, the, the chromosomes are lined up in the middle, uh, just like in uh, metaphase of, of mitosis. In anaphase two, uh, sister chromatids are split apart from each other. So we pull these, these things apart uh, in anaphase two. And finally, in telophase two in cytokinesis, we have the, the nucleus reforming around the DNA, uh, and we have haploid daughter cells forming. Uh, so we end up with one, two, three, four haploid daughter cells that each have half of the, the DNA that we started with. So there's a, a couple of important places where meiosis and mitosis are similar. Uh, and in, so in the, the overall order of things and like kind of what happens, like metaphase in both of them it, it involves things lining up in the middle. But there are some really important distinctions between the two. So meiosis is pretty similar to mitosis, except that uh, in meiosis, we start with a diploid cell and we end up with a haploid cell. So the number of chromosomes in the daughter cells are half of what you start with with meiosis. In the case of mitosis, they're identical. So the, the sister, the, the, 
the chromosomes that re, the, the sorry the cells that result from mitosis are identical to the cell that you started with. So that's one important distinguish uh, one important thing. Uh, there is crossing over, right? So remember all the way back at prophase one of meiosis, we had bits of DNA being swapped around between chromosomes. Uh, that uh, only occurs in meiosis. That does not occur in mitosis. Finally, uh, meiosis produces four daughter cells, and the daughter cells are not identical to each other, right? So they, they don't have the same exact DNA that the, that the parent cell had. Uh, and I'll show you why that, why that is in a minute. So this is a side-by-side -side comparison of, of mitosis on the, on the left versus meiosis on the right. Uh, and so in each case, the parent cell has four different chromosomes, right? So, uh, so they have two pairs of chromosomes, essentially, right? So there's one pair right there uh, and another pair right there. And here's one pair over there and another pair right there. So one difference that you see here is that in meiosis, we have crossing over. So we have homologous chromosomes are forming tetrads and swapping around DNA with each other. Another thing that you see uh, that's different is that in mitosis, uh, all we do is, is separate sister chromatids. Uh, so they're pulled apart from each other uh, here and here during anaphase. Uh, whereas in meiosis, we have uh, an anaphase one, but then we have a second anaphase. Uh, in anaphase one, we separate homologous chromosomes. Then in anaphase two, we separate sister chromatids. Uh, so the, the anaphase 2 is, is identical to anaphase and mitosis, but anaphase 1 is, is where we separate, separate homologous chromosomes, so different from mitosis. And then finally, when you look at the, the cells that result, right, so this cell in this cell, they are identical to each other. They have the same exact DNA. If you, if you look at the, the colors and the, and the size of the, the, the chromosomes, they're identical. And they're identical to the parent cell. Uh, and they, and because they're identical to the parent cell, and because we started with the diploid cell up here, right? So two sets of chromosomes, which is why there's blue and red. Uh, we have diploid cells down here, right? So we start diploid and we end diploid. Whereas in the case of meiosis, right? So we started with this same this this cell that has uh, that has two sets of, of chromosomes, and what we end up with is four cells that each just have half the number of chromosomes that the parent did, so it's haploid. And if you look closely, the DNA is not identical between the four of them, right? So like this one ended up mostly with chromosomes from dad, whereas this one ended up mostly with chromosomes from mom, right? So that the DNA is, is different between, uh, between those daughter cells. Uh, and there is a and there's a really important consequence of that, which is kind of shown by this, right? So, so that's my dad, that's me, that's one brother, that's another brother. Uh, and you can see that, that me and my brothers, even though as far as we know, we all came from the same dad and mom, uh, we are not identical to each other. Uh, and so the consequence of, this, of meiosis, uh, of how it works, is that eggs and sperm uh, are not identical. Right, so each sperm cell or egg cell that you create in your whole life is unique. Right, so sperm and egg cells, because of the process of meiosis, have unique bits of DNA in them, uh, which is why even if two, you know, even if two siblings have the same exact parents, they're not going to be genetically identical to each other, uh, because those two siblings would have came from different sperm cells in different egg cells. Uh, of course, the the notable exception to that is in the case of identical twins. Right, so identical twins uh, come from the same egg and the same sperm. Uh, but essentially what happens is that very early in development, uh, the, the zygote splits uh, and becomes two different zygotes, uh, which is why identical twins have the same exact DNA as each other. So we learned about crossing over, about the swapping around of, uh, of DNA. Uh, but I want to talk a little bit about independent assortment uh, and how that makes uh, uh, unique combinations of DNA when we make egg and sperm. So independent assortment uh, refers to how chromosomes are oriented during metaphase one. Uh, and in the, the independent 
so the assortment part refers to how these cells are, are, are lined up. Because in this present configuration, all of the dad chromosomes are going to go to the left and all the mom chromosomes are going to go to the right. right? So that's how they're going to be assorted. Uh, the independent part refers to how what goes on with this chromosome pair up here has no effect, is completely independent of what happens down here. Uh, so, so essentially what happens here, completely separate from down there. It's like flipping two different coins. Right? If you flip two different coins, the outcome of one coin flip does not affect the outcome of the other coin flip. Uh, and that's what's going on here with these, with these chromosomes. So if we had a, a cell like this uh, in meiosis, uh, in metaphase one of meiosis, we could have this orientation, but it's just as likely that we could have this orientation, uh, where what's going to happen here is now we're going to have a mom chromosome and a dad chromosome go this way, and then a dad chromosome and a mom chromosome go that way, right? So they would be they would be split up in in different ways. So that's what independent assortment refers to, uh, the fact that that with each pair of chromosomes, uh, uh, there's essentially two options. Uh, there's option A where say the dad chromosome goes to the left and then option B where the mom chromosome goes to the left. And what happens here has no effect on what happens down there. So the, the consequence of this is that there is a lot of possible variations of, of chromosomes that can be put into an egg or a sperm cell. Right, so with, uh, with orientation one, we have the dad chromosome on the left, mom chromosome on the right. Whereas in, uh, in this other possibility, uh, we have, we have the, this mom chromosome on the left and this dad chromosome on the right. right so we have these two different possibilities uh, because, because what happens at one set of chromosomes doesn't affect what happens at the other set of chromosomes. Uh, those two possibilities are going to lead to that. Uh, and finally, you're going to lead to these four different possible combinations where you can have all chromosomes from dad, all chromosomes from mom. You can have some from mom and some from dad or some from mom and some from dad in the, in the opposite way. So essentially with a, a cell like this, there would be four different possible combinations of, of chromosomes. Uh, and now in this case, this is two pairs of, of chromosomes. So two pairs of so if you have two pairs of chromosomes, it leads to four different combinations. Uh, if you have many more like us, where we have you know 23 pairs of chromosomes, that leads to millions of possible combinations of of DNA the, of chromosomes in the in their arrangement as they are passed on uh, into your egg or your sperm cells. Uh, which is why then it is it is incredibly unlikely that two siblings that aren't identical would have the same exact DNA. Uh, in fact, you have a better chance of winning the lottery, you know, every day for the rest of your life than having two kids that, that are not identical twins, but have the same DNA as each other. So sometimes uh, there can be issues that can go on with meiosis. Uh, you know, just as we learned about in the case of DNA, replica DNA replication, sometimes the machinery that, that that does all this stuff, sometimes that machinery fails us. Uh, and that can happen in meiosis. So something that can occur uh, is what's known as non-disjunction. Uh, so that's where uh, two uh, chromosomes that should separate during meiosis don't separate. Uh, and, what we, and what the result is, is not the correct number of chromosomes. So in the case of a human, that would look like instead of having 46 uh, chromosomes, you might end up with 47 chromosomes, or you might end up with 45 chromosomes, right? So not having that, that standard number of 46, uh, 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 how we get that is, is through non-disjunction. Uh, and so there are a few, different, uh, a few different types of genetic disorders that kind of come from this. One that probably a lot of you uh, are familiar with is Down syndrome. So Down syndrome, uh, the, other, the other name for it is trisomy 21. Uh, the tri part refers to three, and, and the 21 part refers to the 21st pair of chromosomes. So if a person has three copies of the 21st chromosome, uh, they have Down syndrome, uh, which you know, has effects on, on physical appearance. It has effects on, on learning and cognition. Uh, uh, that's what Down syndrome is. 
And so a person with Down syndrome, essentially they have 47 chromosomes, right? Instead of having 46 chromosomes, like, like most humans do, they have 47 instead because they have an extra copy of the 21st chromosome. There are uh, other, there are other examples of, of non-disjunction, right? So for instance, uh, there is, uh, sometimes people can be born with one X chromosome and two Y chromosomes. Uh, I think probably a, a lot of you know that an X chromosome is, is what, you know, gives a person or what typically gives a person kind of like female-ish uh, features, whereas Y chromosome gives a person kind of male-ish uh, features. And uh, sometimes a person can uh, be born with one X and two Ys. Uh, so that makes a male, but it's not a, a typical male with one X and one Y. Uh, sometimes people can be born with just an X chromosome and no other X or other Y. Uh, so there's a lot of different uh, genetic disorders that come about from this when chromosomes don't separate during meiosis uh, that lead to a person having, you know, not exactly 46 chromosomes. So that's all I need to tell you about mitosis and meiosis. Uh, next time we're gonna kind of apply what you learned here uh, and we're gonna think about it more in the context of, uh, of why parents and offspring look similar uh, and what actually happens to make a person look the, the way they do.